Please be seated. There we go. There we go. Oh, look at that. It works. All right. Let me get this thing set back up. And then, uh, all right. Kind of a sobering day yesterday, wasn't it? September 11, 19 years uh, since the Twin Towers and over at the Pentagon and up in Pennsylvania and all those things. A sobering, sobering day. Um, it seems to me as if the world has just gotten crazier and crazier since that day. I don't remember things being quite as crazy since before September 11. Things just are wild in this world. Um, The ideas that people come up with, the actions that people do, uh, the world is a crazier place since that day, I think. A tough, tough day. Everybody probably remembers where they were at that day. Um, The world kind of stood still here in America. I was living overseas at the time. And uh, it was a very scary thing to live overseas and to have the airports shut down. I heard rumors of AK-47s in the airports, army and everything. And the world just keeps on getting crazier and crazier. The things that people believe today are mind-blowing. There seemed to be a sense of common sense before then, I guess, on what people believed. They thought things through. Today, people believe anything. And to show you that, this sign was up in Colorado, downtown Denver, this week. It says, birds aren't real. Wake up, Colorado. Pigeons equal government surveillance drones. Now, you would think, all right, somebody escaped out of some house after they got a hold of the printer and the copy machine, and they put this up. And you can't see it. It's cropped out of the bottom. There's a website that says birdsaren'treal.com. You can go check out their website, which the website is surprisingly professional. You can buy T-shirts that say birds aren't real. You can buy hats that say birds aren't real. They have a whole store. And I was thinking, all right, there's not a lot of people that really believe this, right? Oh, but there's a Facebook page, a closed group, that says this, and I circled for you, it might be too small to see, the number of people in this closed group on Facebook, this group called Birds Aren't Real, there are 70,294 members of this group. 70,000 people think birds aren't real. wonder what they think at Thanksgiving. I wonder if they've ever eaten at a KFC. They're like, man, this drone tastes great. People will believe anything today. 70,000 people. And you read through some of the stuff, and they said, please don't post pictures of dead birds with their guts coming out. We know they're not real. Because I guess people have been on there like, no way, I'm going to show you that these birds, they didn't even want to hear that stuff. Common sense is gone. 70,000 people blew me away when I saw that. 
this sign right there, up in Denver, downtown Denver. And I was reading through the comments on there, and people were tagging each other. The, the guy who posted this was like, see, I told you, I, I was going to put this up there, and all kinds of people believing in it. People will believe anything today. It's harder and harder to find what truth is with so many different things going around. But the Bible tells us where error originates. In fact, it identifies the person who they call, the Bible calls the father of lies. And it even goes so far as to say that lies are his native language, and that is the devil. We remember the first lie in the Bible, in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve fall for the lie that they will never, ever die. In fact, the fruit that God forbid them to eat would make them like God and smarter. It's been a trick of the devil to distort the truth and get people to follow a lie for a very, very long time. But God calls us to find and follow the truth. His name, in fact, has the truth in it. He is the way, the what? The truth and the life. And once we find truth in the Bible, God calls us to stay faithful to his truth no matter what. It's tough to be faithful sometimes when no one around us is being faithful. Let's rewind back to the very beginning of the Bible. These are the first 10 names listed in the Bible as far as fathers who begat who. Some people say, man, it's really boring all the begats. Um, it's pretty interesting if you look through and picture the family, who these people were. We have the first one, Adam. You're probably familiar with Adam. Then uh, Cain and Abel, you know them. But the next one in line, who was faithful, that lived, was Seth. Seth was the father of Enosh. Enosh was the father of Canaan. Canaan was the father of, anybody want to try and pronounce that one? Mahalalel or something like that. Uh, he was the father of Jared. Jared was the father of, who's the next one? Enoch. Enoch was the father of Methuselah. Now, let's stop there at Methuselah for just a second. What we haven't mentioned so far are how old these guys got. How many candles were on their birthday cakes each year. They needed a fire department every time somebody had a birthday. Methuselah. How old was Methuselah? Anybody know? 900 and 69 years old. This guy was alive for almost one-sixth of the whole earth's history. Almost a thousand years old. That is mind-blowing. Now, a lot of people have said, well, that part of the Bible can't be true. There's no way that can be true. Humans don't live that long. Well, we don't anymore. There's a lot of life on this planet that lives longer than we do. There's a jellyfish that's called the immortal jellyfish. They've never seen one die. It can regenerate itself almost. They've got sharks up in Iceland that have been um, measured. They, they think they're about 400 years old. You've seen those big giant tortoises down in South America? Those things are like 180, 200 years old, 300 years old, something like that. The idea of creatures living a long period of time is not foreign today. It's unlikely for us as humans but it wasn't always like that. I have a friend back in Fallbrook, California, where I grew up. Her name is Betsy. She's 103 years old. Still drives, sharp as a tack, 103 years old. My mom has a friend. Her, her grandmother is 106 this week. Anymore, 103, 106, you're like, whoa. Anybody, by the way, just a curious, anybody know somebody over 100 years old? Anybody? A couple people? Okay. Anybody know somebody over 105? Oh, I'm 105. That's your, your, your grandmother was 112, you told me. Amazing. Amazing. These guys lived a long time. Methuselah, 969 years. Methuselah was the father of Lamech. Lamech was the father of Noah. So just, just for family um, integration and, and looking at this, Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather. Noah probably never met his great-grandfather. Why was that? When Noah asked Grandpa Methuselah, Grandpa Methuselah, tell me about your dad. That's because he'd never met Enoch. 
And when Methuselah told his grandson Noah about his great-grandfather, he would have told him, well, your grandfather's in heaven. And that's the only time that statement's ever been true. (laughs) Your grandfather's in heaven. Because Enoch really was in heaven. God took him, the Bible says. 969 years. Now, in this period of time, the earth was a terrible place to live for most of it. A terrible, terrible place to live. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Now, we live in a world that we can't imagine being any worse than it is when you read the news. It's depressing, isn't it? You think, how can people be this evil? The things that are done. It was worse than this back in Noah's time. We go from all of the begats here with Adam, Seth, all the way down to Noah. And in Genesis chapter 6, it starts off and says, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves among all whom they chose. Now, a lot of people say, Pastor Jamie, what does that mean? What does it mean when it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they married them? Um, I've had people say, Jamie, does that mean like angels came down and married people? What does that mean? Well, when it says that term, remember we have two different classes of people on the planet at this point. We have the followers of God and the people who don't follow God. Those two different people. There's a, in the Bible you see the term heathen sometimes, which is non-derogatory really. It just means they don't believe in God. It's a classification of who you follow. And so when it says that the sons of God, these would be, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God if you're here and you believe in God. It says, saw the daughters of men, or that would be people who are not followers of God. So they were intermingling through marriage between followers of God and heathens, or non-followers of God. Okay, that's what that means there in the Bible. There were no angels coming in and uh, creating more children. That's not what the Bible says here. They were intermarrying between those who believed and did not believe. In verse 3 it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days will be 120 years. Now, it's kind of interesting the number that God picks here, 120 years. I'm reminded of a different number with a somewhat similar situation with the city of Nineveh, with Jonah. How long did God give Nineveh to get their act together and turn things around? Do you remember? 40 days, right? 40 days, and God chooses 120 years here. It's a much different number. They have 120 years left. Verse 4, what was it like there? It says, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old who were men of renown. Giants. Have you ever been some, next to somebody really, really tall before? A very, very good friend of mine is six foot eleven. Six foot eleven. I grew up with his family. He's the youngest of all the siblings. And uh, so he's kind of our little brother, we call him, at six foot eleven. When you try and give this guy a hug, you feel puny. When I stand next to him, his shoulder's right about up here. And you just feel tiny. He used, to, he used to take my kids and he would swing them by their feet. <laughs> just swing them like they were nothing. Big guy. Just a huge, huge guy. The Bible says there were giants, big people all over the planet at this time. Men of renown. Verse 5. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What does living in a world like that look like? Every single thing, it says every thought of their mind was of evil all the time. There wasn't any good left on the planet. Nobody was following God anymore. No one was listening. No one was following his precepts and guidance except for one family. The rest of the whole planet had totally turned their backs on God, had embraced 
the temptations that were thrown their way and were following the devil. The devil was having a heyday with all the people here on this earth. In verse 6, it was so bad that the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. God looked down on this planet. God sees all the hurt that happens here. And there was so much evil and so much hurt on this planet. God looked down and he said to himself, wish I wouldn't have made him. It says he was grieved in his heart. When God sees the horrible stuff that goes on in this world, it grieves his heart. It hurts to see the people that he loves suffer. And he looked down and said, this world is a mess. In verse 7 it says, I, the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Verse 8 says, but. And this is a great segue here because you have such a dark and dismal description of the earth right now. It's terrible. Everything's evil. It's all terrible. So when we see that next word, but, we got to know that's good news coming. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was faithful to God. Even though all around him everything was crazy, nobody was following God. Noah didn't have any friends that were a good influence on him. Can you imagine that? Noah did not have any friends who he could go to with a problem and say, hey, what, what should I do here? He had no positive influence from friends in his life. None. Because every thought of every person around there was evil continually. Can you imagine how lonely that must have felt? To always have negative influence and temptation all the time. The people that lived around him. Can you imagine the devil? He's got almost everybody except for Noah. Who gets most of the attention for temptation in that scenario? Probably Noah. And yet... Even in that difficult scenario, Noah stayed faithful to God. He, was, he and his family were the only ones that remained committed to God throughout all of this. Let's continue on verse 9. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. Noah walked with God, just like his great-grandfather did. Noah had no doubt heard the stories of great-grandfather Methuselah, or uh, Enoch, from his grandfather Methuselah. And he was just like Enoch, his great-grandfather. These are the only two men that it says they walked with God like this. The only two. Now, what was it that allowed him to be described as walking with God? How was his relationship this tight with God to be called a just man, to be the last man on earth that was faithful to God? What was it that classified him as this? Turn over to verse 22. Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, and it's the last verse in the whole chapter. It's right here on the screen if you haven't looked it up there yet. It said, thus Noah did, according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Whatever it was that God asked Noah to do, Noah said, I'm in. I'll do it. No matter what it was, he was so close with him that he had developed such trust with God that Noah said, no matter what it is, I'll do it. Even when God came to Noah and said, by the way, I know you've never built a boat before. I'd like you to build a ship. We're going to have all the animals from the world on it. I'd like you to build it. What if God asks you to do that? 
What would your be, response be if God said, hey, time out on whatever you're doing for a career right now. I want you to be a boat builder. You have five acres? Great. I want the boat to be five acres long. <laughs> Don't worry about what your neighbors are going to think. I want you to build a boat. And then on a specific day, I'm going to have all the animals in Colorado come and join your boat. What would you think about that request? Would it be easy to say yes to that? It'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? And yet Noah was so close to God that when God asked him to change his whole career and be a boat builder, Noah said, I can do that. I'm in. Because in Noah's life, everything that God asked him to do, he did. Whatever God commanded him to do, he was like, I'm in. I'll do it. And because of that, Noah was known as a man who walked with God. He was known as a just man. It even says he was perfect in all of his generations. Strong statement, isn't it? Why? Because Noah was obedient to his God. He followed God's commandments to the T. It wouldn't budge on them or compromise at all. They were the ones that remained faithful even though everything around them was crazy. Now, they were a type of remnant. The word remnant in the Bible is reserved for people, a small group of people out of a larger group that remain faithful to God no matter what. We see this term and this idea many times throughout the Old Testament. Here um, we'll see the similarities between before Jesus comes and the times of Noah. We see here in Matthew 24, verse 33, Seven. It says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of who? Noah. Now, that I think encompasses all of the evil that happens where God finally has to come in and clean things up. I agree with that. But I believe it also means that just like Noah was a remnant, the ones that, his family were the ones that remained faithful to God's commandments, is what the Bible says, I believe that there will be a remnant of people before Jesus comes that will also be faithful to the commandments of Jesus Christ. That's what it's saying here. In several different areas, it will be just like it was with Noah when Jesus comes. There will be a remnant that is on the earth that follows the word of God and the commandments of God. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts has left us a very small, what's that word? Remnant. We should have been like as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Here Isaiah is talking about the idea of everyone, kind of like in Noah's scenario, everyone being like Sodom and Gomorrah, which again was evil all the time, a terrible, terrible place. But he said there was a remnant, a small number of people who remained faithful to the commandments of God. All throughout the Old Testament we see references. This here's a New Testament, Romans chapter 9 verse 27. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, is what it says. Romans chapter 11, verse 5. I've kind of doubled up there. Even so, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, it talks specifically about grace in reference to the remnant because It's not because of anything we do that we are saved. We are saved by the grace of Jesus. And because we are saved by the grace of Jesus, we want to obey his commands. So the remnant is saved according to the election of grace. Now, there is a verse here in Revelation chapter 14. And Revelation chapter 14 is an amazing study to look at. In this, it's talking about the end times before Jesus comes, and it talks about who is saved. Now, for me, I want to know who that is. I want to fit that mold. Not because I want to pat on the back from anybody else. It's because I want to be saved. I want to be with Jesus. And so as Jesus reveals this stuff in Scripture, I'm paying attention because I want to be saved. And I would encourage you to pay attention as well if you want to be saved. Because this is hugely important. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience 
of the saints. Now let's stop there for a minute and to look at that word saints. Does the word saint reference bad or good people? Have you ever heard that term? Man, that lady's a saint. That guy's a saint. Have you ever heard that term before? It usually means they're a pretty awesome person. It's a very good thing. Now the saints here represent those who follow God and are saved. Before Jesus comes, this references the people who are going to be in heaven with Jesus. I want to be in that number. Here is the patience of the saints, the Bible says. Here are those, and we get a key, a key element of who they are by what they do. Here are those that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the identifying pieces of God's people before he comes is that they are commandment-following people. They look to God's commands, as did Noah, and they follow the commands of God. That is one of the identifying pieces that shows who the saints are in the Bible. And friends... I want to be in that number. I want to be one of the people described here in Revelation as one of the saints. One of the people on their way to heaven. And so as I read this, I have no choice as a follower of Jesus to make the Ten Commandments first and foremost in my walk with Jesus. Following his commands just like Noah did. Micah 6, 8, I love this verse. It was taught to me as a song when I was a kid. He has shown you, O man, what is good. God has given us everything we need to understand which way is towards him. He has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and just like Enoch and Noah, to walk humbly with your God. You see, God is calling you to walk with him just like Noah walked with him. You want to know how to walk with your God? Follow his commands just like Noah did. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. That is your call from Holy Scripture, is to walk humbly with your God, just like Noah did, and to keep his commands. Let's review them, just for reviewing's sake. How do we follow his commands? What will God's remnant people, the saints before he comes, what will they be doing on earth? They will have no other gods before them. Now, some of these you might look at. We're going to get to the idol one here in, in number two, the second commandment. You shall have no other idols before me. And you might think, well, that's a good Old Testament illustration. The Israelites had idols. We've got to remember that outside of our pocket here in Colorado, there are still idols being worshipped around the world legitimately in religions. And so this is a big deal still for a lot of people around the world. I can remember... I was in, uh, teaching in Thailand. Aaron and I lived in Thailand, and we were both teaching. I was teaching a Bible course to 99% of the class. They were Buddhist. And all over Thailand, there are these huge golden images. I mean, straight out of the book of Daniel. <laughs> huge golden images. Some standing up, some laying down, some inside of caves, all over the place. And as we studied through the Ten Commandments, we talked about bowing down to idols, which is a big deal there. If you go to any of these big sites there, you will see people, Old Testament style, bowing down to a golden image. Right even today. And I remember it was one of the coolest moments of my whole time there. There was a young girl, uh, she went by the name of Kate, because Westerners probably can't pronounce her name, because it was about this long. So I was very happy to call her Kate. A sweet, sweet young lady. And after we studied this, it was on a Friday, they all went home for the weekend. And she came back on Monday. And she told me, she, she stayed after class, she says, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah. So she stayed after class, and she said, hey, I, I, I remember what we studied this, this last Friday. 
she said, I just wanted to tell you that my whole family went out. We had this big festival we were supposed to go to. And in the front, everybody was there, and there was this big golden image of Buddha there. And she said, everybody at a certain time was supposed to go down and kneel down in front of the, the golden statue. She said, I stayed in the back of the room, and I didn't do it. Everyone else went, and I just stayed back and kept my seat, and I didn't bow down to that image. And I didn't stop smiling for like a week. It was one of the coolest things that's ever happened because this little girl stopped worshiping idols and started thinking about worshiping God. And so these things, although we don't have golden images here in the United States, and it's not really a temptation for us, it's a legitimate thing that people around the world struggle with. It's a legitimate temptation that the devil still uses. And God wants to remind everyone around this globe, worship only me. The first commandment, God's people before he comes will have no other gods before him. They will make no idols. The third commandment of God, God's people before he comes will not take his name in vain. Now this one, let me stop here for just a second. As we quickly review these, a lot of people have always thought, well, that just means using God's name as a curse word, which, yeah, we shouldn't do that. There is a, um, a Jewish scholar that went through the Hebrew breakdown of this commandment, and he said really what this points to is using God's name as an excuse for doing bad things. For instance, how many of you remember David Koresh? Remember that, 1990, whatever that was, 91? David Koresh was a, uh, totally a false prophet. Had his whole compound down in Waco, Texas, which now, thanks to some decorating people, Waco is known for other things besides, uh, besides um, crazy cults. <laughs> What's that? Magnolia, I think it's called. All the ladies are like, yeah, Magnolia. How do you not know that name? Now it's known for Magnolia. But before, it was known for this crazy cult. And David Koresh told all the men in this cult, he said, God wants you to give me your wives. And he used God as an excuse to do something horrible and wrong. And this Jewish scholar said, looking at the Hebrew writing, he says that is what he thinks the main, reason, the main point of this third commandment is. Doing horrible things in the name of God. Spiritual abuse. God's people, before he comes, will not be spiritually abusing people. God's people, before he comes, will keep the Sabbath day holy. That's what the Bible says. God's people before he comes will be honoring their father and mother and being respectful to their parents. God's people before he comes will not be murderers or adulterers. God's people before he comes will not be thieves. They won't lie or covet. God's people, the remnant and faithful to him, will follow his commands and walk humbly with their God they will be faithful to the commands of God. Anybody know the name Peter Waldo? Anybody heard the name Peter Waldo before? Peter Waldo was a man who lived in Lyon, France in the 12th century. And he was a businessman turned preacher. He got his hands on a Bible and started reading it. He started preaching from the Bible. He started disagreeing from the pulpit with a lot of the, the popular ideas that had been around for a very, very long time. People started to follow Peter because they were convicted by his biblical preaching. He refused to accept the teachings of purgatory because it wasn't in the Bible. He had a Bible. He didn't see anything about purgatory in the Bible. Can you imagine some of these first people who got their hands on the Bible? They'd heard this teaching their whole life, and they look, and they're like, that's nowhere in here. You imagine the light bulb that just popped on? We've been lied to for all these years. There's no purgatory in the Bible. He started preaching that. That wasn't popular with the established church at the time. He refused to accept the teaching of venerating the saints. He refused to accept the teachings of confessing to priests. It wasn't in the Bible. He refused to accept the teaching of baptism by sprinkling. He saw baptism by immersion in the Bible, and he preached that. He refused to accept the teaching of transubstantiation where it's taught that in communion the bread and the wine turns directly into the actual flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Not a biblical thing. 
Well, he was excommunicated, surprisingly. <laughs> and after he was excommunicated, he was never heard from again. More than likely, he was killed for being faithful to God's word and preaching Bible truth. But his followers who had been listening to his Bible preaching and were convicted, they started sharing the same things. His last name was Waldo. His followers were known as Waldensians. You may have heard of them before. The Waldensians kept the seventh day Sabbath for a very long time. In, a, in addition to these other teachings that they found out in the Bible. And they were faithful to the Bible teachings in Scripture. In fact, they were written about by a Dominican inquisitor, Father Moneta of Cremona in northern Italy, because they would not give in to the teaching of Sunday being a holy day. He wrote, and it's a whole chapter on this book, it's called De Sabato and De, De Dominico, and he discussed the significance of the Sabbath and compared it to the day to the Lord's Day, which was Sunday. So we know that they were worshiping on Sabbath for a very long time. These Waldensians were committed to following the truth in the Bible and the Bible only. They continued to work, and as they were caught, they were also excommunicated, and when that didn't stop them, the Waldensians were hunted down and killed for their faithfulness in Jesus and their faithfulness to the Word of God. You can go into northern Italy today and go on some tours to see where these Waldensians lived way back in the mountains when they were chased out of the villages where they lived so they could worship in peace. Someday I'm going to go there. I haven't made it to northern Italy yet. I've been to southern Italy. But northern Italy is high on my list of places I would like to go because I would love to see these valleys and hills where the Waldensians hid and were able to stay faithful to God, running for their lives because of their faith. They vowed to remain faithful to God's word, no matter what, and his commands. Revelation 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. God has called us to be faithful to him and faithful and obedient to his commands as the last day people here on earth. As Christians... He calls us to be faithful. We talked a little bit last week about God's sign for his people. In the Bible, he called the Sabbath his identifying sign between he and his people. There was a rabbi, 1946. A lot of Jewish children had been given up to orphanages and convents to try and save them during World War II. So intermingled with a whole lot of the... The uh, Catholic kids were a lot of the Jewish kids. They had just been dropped off in hopes that they would be saved because things were getting crazy. 1946 rolled around and Rabbi Yitzhak Halevi Herzog went to a large monastery where he was told there were a lot of Jewish children that had been sent away by their parents to protect them. The rabbi went to the head nun thanked her profusely for saving these children and said he would like to have these children back and try and find their parents or a Jewish home that they could grow up in. The nun said, well, we have no idea who is who. It's been several years that they've been here. Some were dropped off as babies, as little kids. There's no way we can really tell who is who, who is a little Jewish baby. Rabbi Herzog assured the nun that he would know he asked her to bring all of the children, some 500 children, into one big room. They all got there. He got up on the stage, and with a very loud voice, he said in Hebrew, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That's kind of a unique thing to say, isn't it? How's he going to tell these kids apart, who's Jewish and who's not? He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Immediately. Dozens of children rushed the stage, shouting, Mama, Papa, with tears in their eyes. Some were sobbing uncontrollably. 
Though few of the children remembered much of their early lives, they remembered the sound of the Shema, which he had just recited, a Jewish prayer, because they had said it each night with their parents before they went to bed. They remembered those Hebrew words from their parents long before, even though they'd forgotten a lot of other things. And this triggered in their minds and identified who they were. These kids came running up to this rabbi, and he knew which kids were his. You see, when God comes, he's going to be looking for his people. He's going to be looking for the people who have chosen him and have chosen to walk with him. And by following his commands, he'll know exactly who he's looking for. Friends, I want to challenge you today. Don't let anything get in the way of you being 100% faithful to God and his commands and his guidelines for you in the Bible. There may be a whole lot of different things in life where you could be like, well, that's not so bad. He probably won't mind. It's kind of a little vague on that topic anyways. Friends, be 100% committed If there's something in your life that's kind of on the edge, you might have been justifying it for a while, it's not worth it. It is not worth it. If there's something in your life that's distancing you a little bit from God, nothing's worth it. My challenge to you is to be 100% committed to God like Noah was. So that can be said of your life, he walks with God. She walks with God with God. I invite our worship team to come up. We're going to sing a closing song. It says, it's called Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. It was written by Charles Wesley. You probably don't know Charles, but you might know his brother, John Wesley. Charles Wesley was the youngest of 18 children. He was an evangelist, a Bible scholar. And his last verse of this song, it says, So now thy blessed name I love. Thy will would e'er be mine. In his life, he wanted his will to be closely knit with God and to walk with God. Thy will would e'er be mine. Had I a thousand hearts to give, my Lord, they all were thine. Let that be our challenge today, that our hearts will be so closely knit with God that we will be 100% committed to following his guidelines in the Bible so that someday when he comes, he sees you and says, they walk with me. They have given their lives and committed 100% to me. Let's stand together and sing our closing song.